Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabori here. And I feel like I need a drink really bad. Because I just watched the sequel of the original 1995 horror anthology that was executive produced by Spike Lee, the same man who gave us Do the Right Thing, Well Better Blues, Jungle Fever. Among others, along with Rusty Condiff and Darren Scott, both of which had worked on the original film. And this is the best they could do? I'm going to take my Coke Zero with me and just drink it. I waste my fucking time with this. But, it's Tales from the Hood 2, a direct-to-video sequel, this time with Keith David playing Mr. Sims, who's been best known for playing the funeral director by Clarence Williams III. Still with us, but he was now retired from acting, so there you go. It's really sad because he was the best fan about the movie. He really was. I love Keith David. I mean, he's been known for doing films like John Carpenter's The Fane, as well as uh, They Live. He was in the movie Men at Work with Emil Estevez, who also directed it and wrote it, and Charlie Sheen. And most of all, he went on to do voice acting, such as uh, Goliath in the TV show Gargoyles, and Spawn, the title role in Todd Fairlane's Spawn that aired on HBO. He's the best fan about the movie, sadly. The only good fan about it. The rest of the stories... Not so much. In fact, out of all the stories uh, that he had to tell, the one with the psychic guy is the only good thing about it. I hate to say this, but there's nothing scary about it. I mean, it just seems like this time and they just want to focus on today's politics. You know, everything from Black Lives Matter to hashtag me too movements that's going on I mean especially with the president you know Trump and you know, Mike Pence and even the <laughs> Brent Kavanaugh all come to mind what well, really made the original film good I gave the film three stars I did a review on it and it's already on blu-ray by Shout Factory They're part of the Screen Factory label. I still haven't picked it up yet and I hope I do because it's definitely worth the purchase over the sequel which costs only $9.99 or $12.99. It's not even worth it. <laughs> I mean granted the original film costs like 20 bucks by now or maybe $24.99 but it might be a lot lower so chances are if you get it for cheap it's way better than spending a whole lot less for it. <laughs> but anyway, what made the original film good was that it had a solid cast. It had a story to tell. It focuses on the urban life between all these events, you know, child abuse, police brutality, gay members, a former KKK member who's also a racist and he suddenly uh, you know, takes the the house that was actually originally run by a black slave, uh, yeah, black slave woman, who has uh, all of the the slave dolls. This really works. I mean, putting this together into a horror anthology because it just shows how scary it is, how these uh, tragic events and all of this have come to be. This is not smart, 
coming from Rusty Condiff and Darren Scott. I mean, geez, I mean, this is the best they can come up with? It's sad, really. I mean, they had to wait 23 years for this. <sighs> Unbelievable. So it stars Keith David, once again, with Brian Bat, Alexandra Liberi, uh, Kendrick Cross, yeah, Kat Lemkit, uh, Kendrick Brown, and Annie Cohen. And it's written and directed by Rusty Condiff and Darren Scott. The movie begins when we meet Mr. Sims, who's played by Keith David, who suddenly meets a guy named Dumbass Beach. What a name. Who decided to create a robot to serve as a judge, jury, and executioner. Which we begin to find out at the end that it's a all official intelligence robot that's sort of like a second cousin to Chappie. <laughs> Even worse. Anyway, he decided to tell four tales uh, about um, throughout the human behavior that's going directly into the robot. So the first story had to be about two young friends. Yeah, one is white, the other one is black. You stop by at a roadside museum known as, and I'm going to say this, forgive me, the Museum of Negrosity. It's a place where they focus on African American history, including uh, slavery and all of that. But that's when we spotted an old school doll by the name of Golly, or Gollywog. Um, the Bastetter rightfully goes off on the tube by actually attempting to teach them about the history behind all this. This is where they had to go for its ramification on how the Tao was made and how they did all this and how we, we discovered what was going on. But the girl wanted to buy the Tao. So what she did for her plan was to have her boyfriend break in to the museum so that way they could steal the Tao that's inside a glass jar. And this is where it happens. Yeah, one of the, the dolls that you spotted, however, is one of the black slaves from the original film. Yeah, he only gets like a short period of time, sadly, but he does move and he begins to control his mind all the way through a golly doll. So they had to read a book on golly and how he came to be until suddenly they took the glass jar, got smashed, and suddenly through the control of the black slave doll, he now becomes a giant. So he takes, uh, <laughs> he takes down all three of them. He actually took a black whip you know, from the boyfriend and he just uh, whipped them completely until all the the body organs comes right out. Yeah. Hard to believe. Um, they went after the black girl too, so she died. So then the proprietor came by, took the white girl, and we begin to find out that she's pregnant. So that's where we get to see all these tiny gollywog dolls uh, popping up. Yeah. Until she was dead. So, yeah, she died of childbirth through all these tiny uh, gollywog dolls. Unbelievable. And by the way, the acting is horrible coming from the... Well, except for the Papeter, though. Um... It, it, it was just pretty dumb. And they're trying to go bonkers in that particular way. Uh, next up is where we get to see the uh, the TV psychic guy. It started out where, where we get a trio of fugs. Kind of similar to the trio of fugs in the original film. Except 
they were pretty dumb compared to the <laughs> the other three. Um, they were playing to kill an ex-pimp just so they can grab the money. And where did he hit it at? But they accidentally killed them. And they decided to get some information through a, a TV psychic guy. So what happened was they fought to connect with him. The, the psychic guy was, was an actor. Was actually uh, <laughs> making love with uh, a Latina chick. I'm going to say it this way. But they were both um, being held hostage by those uh, trio of thugs. So his plan was he decided to uh, connect through the, the spirit world. He was very nervous too because he was very shocked. He, he's like talking to himself in the bathroom. He's, he's backing himself and he's, he's very uh, nerve wracking. So he <laughs> so at this point on, this is where he, he tears to um, prepare himself to use his spirit to contact all the dead people around. And that's what he did too. His entire head starts to spin, you know, when he becomes uh, all these uh, dead people around. You know, mostly black people, and this is where he contact the pimp that they accidentally killed. And this is when he finally gets his revenge um, on those trio of thugs by actually just using all these techniques to, to kill him with. You know, like the chandelier, and uh, <laughs> also... Uh, you know, they had to spin around with those characters and they killed them one by one. You know, they slashed them. All done in CGI, of course. And at the end, <laughs> yeah, he was preparing for his next program. Yeah, inside the, the procession of the pimp. Yeah, with his girl. <laughs> um, I gotta admit, though, um... That was probably the best one out of all the stories. So I mean, it's not scary, but it's kind of hilarious in a way. But I'm just going to keep it that way. Now we get to the third story, which is really stupid, incredibly dumb. Where we bought um, two guys who are rapists, who suddenly drugs uh, two women. You know, one is black, the other one is Asian. Yeah, we're going for a lot of uh, racial stereotypes here, but that's the whole point. And the rapists, of course, are, are one is black and the other one is white. So they're just going around having a date night. You know, they're about to play the game Cards Against Humanity. Great. Just like with the last movie I saw, which is Unfriended Dark Web, where they also played Cards Against Humanity. What is up with the Cards Against Humanity these days? <laughs> exactly, man. It's really stupid. Um, so anyway, they drugged them. They put him inside the bedroom. You know, they were even t chatting around. I mean, they even said that one of the guys had worked for Marvel, and they even said that I was one of the ones who cast uh, Chris Platt in Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> Go figure. Um, so anyway, uh, they they took him to the bedroom. They're about to film their video through their cell phone, and then they begin to realize that they were invisible only showing their bras and panties that they stripped off and then we learned that they're actually vampires so what they did was the two vampire women decided to um, suck their blood dry until they wound up sending them into the pit at the basement where tons of um, zombified victims are, that are uh, in the cages and they're ready to uh, feed them both while we begin to spot uh, the two women on TV. Uh, God damn it, that, f that was fucking stupid and lame. That's what leads to the final tale where this time they became more serious than becoming more comedic in that way. This just, I mean, this one is just basically a cross between Mississippi burning and Rosemary's Baby in that sort of way. Um, it focuses on a black Republican councilman who was about to vote in supporting of a closing voting location
for black communities around because this was a fundraiser in Mississippi but then he begins to find out that um, he's married to a white pregnant woman and suddenly she's beginning to see a ghost appearing that turned out to be a young Emmett Till so this is where we get to see the early story of Emmett Till when uh, he was about to be brutalized by two white men who took both of them because this was the hands of right racism in 1955 so this is where it leads to the sacrifice for the future and now he's this particular man is throwing everything away and it just becomes so, somewhat of a uh, a modern tale of maybe something out of It's a Wonderful Life or something like that or A Christmas Carol for that matter and they just where we get to see uh, Emmett Till along with the rest of the uh, black families around all, all the black people all as ghosts and the only ones who could spot him is the the white pregnant woman along with his grandfather and his mom it all leads to that because now we begin to find out what the white woman's up to and she just grabs the the lamp knocks them unconscious and the rest of the KKK you know where he was working together with so stupid um, they came by you know they drive in with uh, well along with the doctor because the doctor took uh, the pregnant woman you know, the white doctor and then suddenly uh, she came by she suddenly spits at, at his face <sighs> unbelievable even though he did say that she's not a racist but after the way I saw it, she really is a racist. And so he agreed to, to make the sacrifice uh, from Emmett Till. And he did. He made his choice. And well, he's now beaten up and he died right in front of them. So he took his will. unbelievably bad and that's when we finally get the final act where now the the robot is complete yes as I mentioned looks exactly like a second cousin version of Chappie even worse <laughs> and he was going out of control and this is where he starts to attack um, all the uh, <laughs> the inventors you know, the man and the woman and they're about to go after him because he's the one who created it. And this is where, you know, yeah, Mr. Sims suddenly uh, drives around, you know, trying to save him. But then this is where we get that infamous ending, just like in the original movie where he says, you know, you're not in this world. Welcome to hell, motherfucker. Oh jeez. That's why Clarence Williams III did it better. <laughs> you know, because this was the... Uh, you just didn't see it coming where when you get to see the coffin of him or either the, the, the gangsters because they didn't make it, so that's where we lead to it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, man, but this movie is totally awful not funny um, not scary either it's just fucking lame and disappointing too pointless commentary doesn't make any fucking sense whatsoever in fact none of the film makes any sense at all there's no battleable lesson right here I guess maybe they lost it <laughs> I mean, wow, how low can Spike Lee go from greenlighting the sequel to the original cult classic? That's an underrated gem. 
Never thought I would see the light of day that this movie will get a Blu-ray release with tons of features from Screen Factory, but it's really cool that they got it. It really deserves it. But, seriously, I mean, did he thought that after the success of Get Out last year, you know, with Jordan Peele, you know, writing and directing that movie, they thought that this would suit the audience for this? You know, trying to focus on politics, uh, with greed and lust and all of that combined, especially in today's generation, dumbed down generation if you think about it. I mean, I think he just lost his creativity and his entire mind. It's really sad. Because I thought the acting was incredibly horrible. I mean, coming from all these actors that we got, Except for Keith David, because he's the only good thing that was the servant's presence. Uh, okay, maybe the, the psychic guy wasn't that bad either, but other than that, though, I mean, everyone else was terrible, horrible. I mean, it wasn't pleasant having to watch a white pregnant woman, you know, knocking out a guy, a black guy, and spitting at him, too. Because she, she really is a racist bitch right away. But... <laughs> everyone else was. I just don't understand. But whatever. This gets an 80% on Rotten Tomatoes, which I call that bullshit. The original film had a 47% coming from critics. I don't know if they saw the same movie that I have, but it's obviously there's nothing special and nothing good about it. I say IMDb had uh, a more accurate rating, only 4.5. See, it probably shows how viewers have more taste. What made the original film work is that it had the creativity, it had a powerful message, it had a well-made story to tell between all these actors. I mean, David Allen Greer definitely uh, took the punch right out of the that one story where he was a child abuser. But he's a husband of, of the mother. Yeah, because the son is, uh, the son of course uh, drew him because he's the monster. I mean, it, it's funny because David Allen Greer is a comedian and he's been known for playing a lot of different roles, especially when he was on the TV show Living Color. But having to see him go around beating the shit out of uh, the director and writer. Yeah, Rusty Condiff who played the teacher. Yeah, he started to beat the shit out of everyone until he finally gets it. The special effects uh, for its time were were well done. I mean, for its budget of six million dollars, it only made eleven point eight million dollars uh, when it came out, but it wasn't a hit. Um, and there was a mix of CGI in the film too. I mean, for the transitions and in the fire effect where we can begin to find out about uh, the secret behind Mr. Sims because he is the devil in the skies. You know, when Clarence Williams III played him. Um, but Keith David tried and he's the best fan out of the film. I mean, trying to take his shoes from Clarence Williams III because he retired from acting. Um, so I give him credit for what he did just wasn't really well done at all and I kind of feel bad for both of them but they could do better than this you know you don't have to wait 23 years to actually come up with a better script but it's obviously it needs a better rewrite or better yet a better execution don't make it into a direct-to-video sequel because you know exactly what's gonna happen it's gonna get fucked up up the ass and hire better actors too okay I'm just getting tired of today's shitty actors or any of of all these other upcoming actors who can't act. I understand you're going to go for new people these days, but you got to try harder. You really do. So, I'm sorry, man. I tried. I mean, I out of the shorts that I saw, I like the psychic guy better. Even though it's supposed to be scary, but it's not. 
While it does have some practical effects in the mix of maybe some of the, the other shots of the, the golly doll and all of that going in, uh, the rest of it is shot with CGI that's in the level of an Aslan production or even a sci-fi channel movie, take your pick, where it's all cheesy, <laughs> totally uh, cheap. I mean, even at the end of the movie, you can see the, the robot actually going around attacking everyone and, and try to zap with all of his weapons that he has. You know, because he's out of control. Yeah, you can see that level here. Uh, <laughs> it's like, I don't know how on earth did they have to go for that. And even the budget itself is all TV level. I mean, you can't even tell this is a movie. It almost feels like, like you're watching a TV show that's in that uh, filming level. That's what it looks like. Like, like a sci-fi channel series here. Doesn't look good. It's a waste. Stick to the original film. In fact, buy a copy of the original film uh, from Shell Factory. Or try to see if you can find it at your local Best Buy. I don't know if Target has it, but I think Fry's Electronics would. Or Amazon.com if you must. To get the original film with the collector's edition. It has all the nice extras and everything, so... You're good with it. And stay away from the sequel. Don't even bother picking it up on Blu-ray and DVD. It's not worth it. So anyway, I give Tales from the Hood 2 one star. Yeah, just for Keith David's performance and just the second story. That's it. The rest can go to fucking hell. Especially with all the horrible acting from all the actors. Yeah, even the teenage girls. And guy. I'm Justin Sabora. I'll see you later. Much later. Bye.